your vampires suck, but this video will tell you everything you need to know to fix them. We're going to learn the real world lore and history of vampires, and I'll show you how to apply that to your tabletop role playing games and bring back some of the challenges vampires had back in old school advanced Dungeons and Dragons. This video is a long one because there's so much important info to share with you, and I promise it's worth your time. In fact, I guarantee it. If you watch this video and you don't like it, then I suggest getting tested for COVID because you definitely lost your sense of taste. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! <gasps> I made a bunny! <sighs> but if this is too long for you and you just want to skip past all the real world and game lore to get the DM tips, you can use the timestamps provided in this video's description down below. For my subscribers, no, you're not imagining things. I recently had a vampire video, but but hey, I'm still learning how to make good videos and it was a bomb. But this gave me the opportunity to redo it and correct some content issues with the previous one. It's important you know, the reason we're discussing vampires is because Ig Will, the mother of witches, had a beloved daughter that was a vampire. At least until some do-gooder trespassing dungeon invaders ended her undead state and robbed her lair. From 1982's first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Adventure S4, The Lost Caverns of Socanth by Gary Gygax. And that was the final resting place of Big Will's daughter, Dronza. And it's widely accepted that she was slain in the conclusion of that adventure. An assumption Ig Will laments in the 1985 AD&D adventure Isle of the Eight, also by Gary Gygax. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I'm your host, Atten, and in Monster Lore videos, I typically try to explain every edition's version of the topic creature. I do this to show its evolution leading up to how it is presented in our most current edition. But with these creatures of the night, we don't need as much past game lore since we all pretty much understand what a vampire is. Therefore, I will pay some attention to past iterations, but my primary focus here will be to explain real-world vampire lore and then how you might use vampires most effectively in your fantasy tabletop role-playing games with useful tips and suggestions to challenge even the most jaded players. Real-world lore, origin, and history. To better understand vampires for our fantasy role-playing games, let's take an in-depth look at their real-world lore and mythologies. Looking all around the globe and into the most frightening myths of nearly every culture, we uncover tales of evil supernatural entities, walking corpses, and blood-sucking ghouls with the characteristics of a vampire. Because there are so many variations of these monsters, we can't really define such a creature with a singular description, but here are some general facts you should know. In our real world, there exist leeches, lampreys, and vampire bats all of which have a vampire-like quality to their method of feeding. From ancient Egyptian mythology, some say the lion-headed goddess Sekhmet is the world's oldest vampire story. She was a fierce warrior goddess associated with both plague and healing, but connecting her to vampires is more of a modern fantasy invention than a true historical representation. There are legends of her bloodlust, but this was a vengeful manifestation of Ra's power, not some bloodthirsty undead creature of the night. Lilith and the Lilithu are demons with their origins in ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, and Jewish folklore, thought by some to have vampiric associations. Watch my succubus video to learn the details of those creatures. I'll include a link at the end of this video, so be sure to stick around. In ancient Greek myths, a creature called the Strix, or plural Sturges, was a kind of bird of ill omen, a monster that fed on human flesh and blood. It was also associated with witches and malevolent supernatural beings. Experienced D&D players are likely familiar with the Sturges. But the vampires we are discussing here are not repurposed goddesses or demons. They are undead creatures requiring sustenance to survive. Humans are their preferred meal and they drain their victim of their life force. This is typically accomplished through the consumption of blood, but psychic vampires, those which drain their victim's psychic energy, are believed to exist as well. Though humans are always their preferred targets, some vampires, in desperation, may feed on animals, even lowly rats, but that would only be in a dire emergency. They also seek fresh blood from a living victim. However, 
there are many modern tales of vampires stealing from a blood bank or similar facility. If a vampire is not regularly consuming fresh blood, it may change into a feral and bestial form, losing its human appearance and becoming something monstrous or ghoulish. When imagining the image of a vampire, most think of the well-dressed, suave, and cultured gentleman type from Gothic literature. However, the earliest depictions of these creatures were ghastly bloodsuckers. They were typically purplish, bloated, and gruesome creatures with blood dripping from their mouth. The image of extended fangs would not become a characteristic until later in the evolution of the myths. They are generally creatures who have risen from the dead, but there are rare examples of living vampires as well, including vampire hybrids, half human, half vampire. From Balkan folklore, a damphir is a creature that results from the union of a vampire and a human. Somewhere around 1734, we see the first use of the English word vampire with a Y from 18th century vampire epidemics around Eastern Europe. The root word was probably vampir from Hungarian meaning spirit who feasts upon the living. The so-called vampire epidemics is a label given to a series of events in areas of what are now modern day Serbia Croatia, and Hungary. The people living in these communities became gripped by fears of the dead rising to feast on the living. This vampire panic was a type of mass hysteria which resulted in countless corpses being dug up and barbaric rituals performed over them to destroy alleged vampires. After retrieving the decaying body, villagers would look for signs of vampirism, such as a corpse that appeared unnaturally well-preserved or had blood around its mouth. There are countless historical examples of fearful villagers beheading and burning suspected vampires. Such rituals might also include, but were not limited to, driving a stake into the corpse's chest. This hysteria was almost certainly the product of primitive medical ignorance regarding decomposition coupled with fear and superstitious beliefs. This was compounded by frightening rumors of walking corpses that feast on the blood of the living, spreading plague. Such tales persisted throughout medieval Europe and were particularly prevalent during pandemics. Hmm. Unhinged conspiracies during a pandemic. We are so glad we've evolved past that. Because those primitive people lacked the understanding of infectious diseases, ignorance and fear often turned to conspiracies. Many believed those who became vampires preyed upon their own families even after death which was how they explained the spread of illness in a household. Fred died. After his death, others in the family began to die. So obviously, Fred had returned from the grave to kill his family. Initially, vampire myths depicted a foul, grotesque creature who was hideous to behold. However, that would change by 1819, with English writer John Polidori's The Vampire, which gave birth to our modern image of a charismatic and seductive supernatural being. What few seem to be unaware of is that John Polidori was not only a writer, he was also a physician. More specifically, he was Lord Byron's physician. Lord Byron had previously written a poem about a ghoulish zombie-like vampire. Then in 1816, Byron was visited at his rented home on the shores of Lake Geneva, Switzerland, by the future Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, and John Polidori. The group challenged one another to write a ghost story. It was from their time together that Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, and John created his vampire story from the ideas of Byron. There's a 1986 film by Ken Russell titled Gothic which tells a fictional version of that story. And though Carmilla, the gothic vampire short story by Irish author Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, was written in 1872, it is Bram Stoker's 1897 Dracula, which is remembered as the quintessential vampire novel, Becoming a Vampire. Slavic tradition suggested any corpse that was jumped over by an animal, particularly a dog or cat, either was a vampire or had the possibility of becoming one. Sometimes something as simple as holes appearing in the earth over a grave were taken as a sign of vampirism. To medieval Europeans, redheads were suspected vampires. Similarly, in ancient Greece, redheads were thought to turn into vampires after death, so their bodies were burned before burial to prevent the bloodsucker returning from the grave. The methods of transformation into a vampire may vary, but it is most commonly attributed to being bitten. I had a teacher in high school who absolutely 100% believed that she had been bitten 
twice by a vampire. She even had unexplained marks on her neck and expressed anxiety over being bitten a third time as that would have made her transformation complete. Last I heard, she's in her 70s, so she's still among the living, I guess. Or is she? Many believe a vampire may not enter your house uninvited, but they may trick you into inviting them in. So if you're afraid of vampires, don't put out a welcome mat. There are many known methods for warding off vampires. One is to sprinkle mustard seeds on your roof. Another is to use garlic. Also, holy water may burn vampires just as sunlight, silver, and holy symbols, with the Christian cross being most widely used in pop culture. But as the vampire in the original 1980s Fright Night movie pointed out, that cross only works if you truly believe in its power. If you look online, you'll find dozens of vampire hunter kits reportedly from the 1800s. However, their authenticity is questionable at best. Vampires are not believed to cast a reflection in mirrors. This myth is thought to originate from early mirrors having been made from polished silver. Since silver harms vampires, it made sense that they wouldn't cast a reflection in the material either. As an important addition to this bit of lore, the first verifiable use of silver against a vampire Vampire didn't come until 1939 in a Batman comic. And the vampire's weakness to sunlight? That isn't even part of the original lore and myths either. In fact, it wasn't recognized as harmful to vampires until the 1922 film Nosferatu. The belief in garlic acting as a deterrent may have originated with the disease rabies. In 1998, Spanish neurologist Dr. Juan Gomez Alonso drew a correlation between reports of rabies outbreaks in the Balkans from 1721 to 1728 and the vampire epidemics that erupted shortly thereafter. Wolves and bats, if rabid, took on a snarling, slobbering appearance, which was similar to what folklore described to vampires, as would any human also suffering from rabies. Furthermore, the doctor also found that nearly 25% of rabid humans have a tendency to bite other people, which nearly guarantees transmission since the virus is carried in saliva. Additionally, those infected with rabies are also hypersensitive to any strong scents. This would naturally include the pungent smell of fresh garlic. And did you know the Count from Sesame Street is more than just a cute play on words? Vampires are said to have an obsession with counting, and rice was sometimes sprinkled around the grave of a suspected vampire to keep them busy should it claw its way back to the surface. There is also evidence that some suspected vampires may have been buried face down to confuse them, so it would burrow in the wrong direction so it reawaken from death's embrace. Some scholars believe a rare blood disorder called porphyria in Eastern Europe may have been the origin of certain characteristics attributed to vampires. Porphyria symptoms include sensitivity to light, which could cause blistering skin, and receding gums that give the impression of elongated teeth, killing a vampire. Vampires can be killed with the use of a wooden implement to pierce the heart. In Serbia, they prefer to stake of hawthorn or ash. Other traditional methods of killing vampires include decapitation and stuffing the severed head's mouth with a brick. These practices were said to thwart the after-devourer, a ghoulish vampire-like corpse that chews its own shroud in the grave before consuming its own fingers. Linked to the widespread ignorance about diseases and decomposition, these vampires were believed to kill the surviving members of the family, as it also chewed on corpses in neighboring graves. In 2012, archaeologists in Bulgaria found human skeletons with iron rods through their chests. According to an article published by the BBC in 2012, the pair are believed to have been accused of vampires. Bulgaria is home to around 100 known vampire skeleton burials. As recent as the late 19th century, New Englanders would chop off heads and burn bodies of suspected vampires. They also tore out the heart and lungs, just to be sure. One of the most famous vampires in history was Hungarian noblewoman Countess Elizabeth Bathory who became known as the Countess of Blood. She earned this nickname from allegations that she bathed in the blood of virgins to retain her youth. The Countess and four of her servants were accused of torturing and murdering hundreds of girls and women between 1590 and 1610. But you should know, however, there is some evidence and speculation to suggest that she was innocent of wrongdoing, and those crimes were fabricated by other powerful elites to confiscate her land and wealth. And then there was Vlad the Impaler, born in Transylvania. He served as inspiration for Dracula. He lived from approximately 1428 to 1477. He was a ruthless ruler. From 
Wallachian history and a national hero of Romania. And speaking of real-world vampires, the Vampire of Hanover, Fritz Harman, was a German serial killer operating between 1918 and 1924. He sold mystery meat on the black market to a German population struggling and starving after their World War I defeat. Turns out that meat was how he was disposing of his victims, throwing their bones into the river. Now let's talk about game lore. As far as I can tell, a vampire has been featured in every edition of Dungeons and Dragons since its creation. This includes many different variations from real world cultures around the globe. Dungeons and Dragons vampires first appeared in original D&D's book two, Monsters and Treasures from 1974. It says between one to six may appear that they drain two life levels when they hit an opponent. Now, back in the early days of Dungeons & Dragons, several types of undead would drain you of character levels. This means your 12th level fighter might become a 0 level fighter if he even survives the encounter at all. This entry also informs us that they must always return to a coffin whose bottom is covered with soil from their native land during the daylight hours. The standard gothic vampire then appears in 1st edition AD&D's Monster Manual. The last paragraph in that entry tells us about Eastern vampires which have invisibility instead of charming powers. The vampire with the most terrifying physical appearance comes from 1st edition AD&D's Fiendfolio, a creature called the Penangalon. This absolutely hideous undead takes the form of a disembodied woman's head reeking of vinegar with its internal organs exposed and suspended from the neck as it flies through the air. In 2nd edition AD&D, the gothic vampire reappears. In 3rd edition, we are given vampires and vampires spawn. Now, I really like the entry here for saying that vampire is an acquired template that can be applied to any humanoid or monstrous humanoid creature. A vampire uses all of that creature's base statistics and special abilities, except stated otherwise in that entry. So allowing my mind to wander a bit, vampire kobolds deep in the tunnels of an ancient city, but I digress. This line of thinking should be applied to our current vampiric creations, which I'll explain in a bit. In 5th edition's Von Richten's Guide to Ravenloft Sourcebook, which is one of my favorite 5th edition books, by the way, there's an entry for the Nosferatu on page 230, which is offered as a CR8 undead that possesses the endless thirst of vampires, but none of their grace. Then on page 252, we have an entry for the Vampiric Mind Flayer, which is a CR5 undead creature. Another of my favorite books for the 5th edition is The Dreaded Accursed by Kobold Press Frog God Games. This book is dedicated to the undead. It reminds me of the monster lore section from Bolo's Guide, though that book didn't discuss vampires. The Dreaded Accursed, has a lot of useful details and several unique vampire types. That book informs us that most vampires, especially older individuals who have lived out all of their violent fantasies in their youth, find some channel for their intensity of feelings. Some turn to arcane study, politics, or the arts, while some prefer a life of criminal empire building or remain content to simply hone their skills as a killer. Whatever it is, whatever it sets his mind to, a vampire has potentially a millennia to practice and can exceed any mortal. The book also has a section called The Vampire Archetype, which gives us a lot of suggestions for creating a unique vampire and tips for using the abilities already given. I highly recommend this book if you are running any type of undead themed adventure. Game Master Tips There are just so many books, TV shows, and movies from which to draw our inspiration. In nearly every role-playing game, vampires are represented. Even many futuristic games include them in one form or another. The information I am providing here may conflict with some of the lore and role-playing suggestions offered in a vampire-themed game, such as Vampire the Masquerade. I recommend using whatever meets your criteria for the setting and tone you wish to establish. Vampires and vampiric creatures appear in so many different forms throughout human mythology. This means your vampires can be just as unique. Feel free to take the standard stat block, then change it as much as necessary 
to give your players a surprise. It doesn't even have to look human. Your vampires can have unique powers, weaknesses, and strengths. Allow your creativity to go wild. I'll provide a link to the Wikipedia page for Vampires by Region so you can use that as inspiration. And as I revealed to you in this video earlier, some common vampire myths like aversion to sunlight and silver weapons comes from the early 20th century and seem to be entirely products of Western entertainment industry, books and movies. Therefore, your vampires don't need to follow any of those guidelines and invent your own unique names. And I suggest doing this with all of your monsters in any role-playing game. As Game Master, you know it's a homebrew vampire. But to your players, it's the Blood Drinker of Shadow Grove. Also, when using intelligent vampires as depicted in pop culture, most will be lawful by necessity. Their survival requires structure, rules, and great discretion. They typically have an oppressive and strict society. As represented in The Dreaded Accursed, lesser vampires may be neutral evil, but as they grow more experience, they shift to lawful evil. While you might find a chaotic vampire, such a creature might be viewed as a threat to the survival of their brethren if it betrays their existence. Such a creature would typically be destroyed by others of its kind as soon as its reckless behavior exposed the others to vampire hunters. Of course, there are always exceptions. Anne Rice's vampire Lestat operated out in the open, and you might have a vampire or vampire hybrid with special abilities allowing it to blend in with other humans. In my campaign world, the region inspired by ancient Egypt has a cult to Sekhmet that is led by vampires and vampiric minions. But the vampires have a treaty with the local rulers to only feed on criminals and those foolish enough to venture into their district at night. In this way, they still act as enforcers of Ra's will and bring a measure of stability to the communities where they reside. Early in my current campaign, when the players were just fourth level, they accidentally released an imprisoned ancient vampire. Because the creature had been confined and unfed for thousands of years, it had transformed into a bestial monster that more closely resembled a six foot tall anthropomorphic bat than anything once human. If you're using an unmodified vampire stat block straight from your role-playing game's bestiary, like the Dungeons and Dragons monster manual, we need to understand what that represents. Nearly every role-playing game has a bestiary of monsters and NPC types to oppose your heroes. But remember, those stat blocks only represent the most common type encountered and should generally be considered a template for the rank and file. So even the lowliest of monsters may have a unique individual with special characteristics found among them who might rise to a position of power among the others. When dealing with vampires, this is especially true. I love random encounter charts, and I frequently use them to inject some unexpected surprises into my gaming sessions. And though I would include vampiric minions, followers, familiars, and so on to such randomness, I would never have a true vampire randomly appear. A vampire chooses the time and place of its encounters, and it usually has its followers soften up the target first. So when using a vampire, ask yourself, is this vampire just a lowly, generic example of its kind? Or is it a unique creature with goals and a personality? If you are using the generic stat block, your vampire might be a newly turned, inexperienced, and perhaps reckless bloodsucker. Maybe it is desperate, starving, and taking risks a more experienced vampire would not. The Game Master would need to answer why this is the case, and already a backstory begins to develop. Because every vampire has some type of backstory. Perhaps this careless vampire is so full of hubris that it overestimates its own powers. Such characteristics suggest any previous kills might have been solely made against easily defeated commoners. Has the vampire become lazy and complacent? If so, there are most certainly local legends about mysterious disappearances that none have traced back to its source. Perhaps this vampire operates entirely hidden from human society and is extremely careful in covering its metaphorical tracks. Another option is for the generic vampire to simply be a thrall of a greater vampire. This minion could be an expendable servant sent to 
test the strength of the intruders. While this vampire would initially attempt to show strength and dominance over its prey, as it nears defeat, the undead creature would begin threatening the adventurers with promises of its master's vengeance. A lowly vampire might be a decoy or imposter. Killing this creature might even fool the adventurers into thinking they defeated their intended target, leading them to return with tales of their victory. Unfortunately for them, they discovered later, in the worst way possible, at a time of the real vampire's choosing, that they were mistaken. If you're using a role-playing game set in the modern era or near future, you absolutely need to include some Nazi vampires. That guy with a funny mustache? Well, he was obsessed with the occult. And creating a coven of vampires to infiltrate the world, working secretly for decades or centuries behind the scenes to fulfill his evil schemes? That is a no-brainer. The most powerful vampire of a nest may have established a cult following of loyal servants willing to lay down their lives. And keep in mind, this doesn't automatically assume these followers were even aware of their leader's true nature. Some or all of them may know, but it isn't a requirement. It all depends on what the master vampire chooses to reveal and to whom. I told you about these Sturges from Greek legends earlier in the video. If your adventures occur in an ancient Greek-inspired setting, you may wish to use these bloodsuckers, especially in connection to a more powerful vampire, using them as spies. And not every vampire needs to actually be a vampire. Just like the vampire of Hanover, Fritz Harman, which I mentioned previously, a mortal human may be involved in crimes that are so heinous the local population believes there's a vampire hiding somewhere in the community. This is a great scenario for first level heroes who hear about a vampire feeding on local residents. And imagine what happens if some actual vampires hear about this and come to eliminate the unruly imposter vampire. As Game Master, you can really mess with expectations by simply having local townsfolk incorrectly labeling something as a vampire while scaring the poop out of your players who know they're not powerful enough to take on a vampire. And consider creating a unique vampire that doesn't drain life force but psychic energy instead, draining wisdom and intelligence. The mind player vampire would be perfect for this, a vampire layer and regional effects. If we know the weaknesses of a vampire and how to defeat one, you can be sure it knows as well. Therefore, it is absolutely not going to put itself in any situation that could expose it to risk of an easy defeat. I've lost count, no pun intended, of how many vampire movies I've seen where the creature makes its home inside some location with big windows, where all the heroes need to do is open the curtains or break the glass to let in the rising sun. No vampire, even the most reckless and inexperienced, would ever inhabit such a death trap. A particularly powerful vampire will produce regional effects in the lands surrounding its lair. The Monster Manual for 5th edition offers some suggestions, but feel free to expand on that and make those somewhat reflective of the vampire's personality. A true vampire lair will never be an easy conquest, and the vampire you're hunting will never be alone. Vampires have a near eternity to plan their defense and amass intricate schemes and traps to guard their lairs. And a vampire should have the ability to transform into a gaseous form. This means they could place their coffin behind physical traps and obstructions that mortals could not easily access. In the Lost Caverns of Socanth, for example, Igwil's daughter has her coffin sealed behind stone that is only accessible through a small crack which she enters in gaseous form. The Curse of Strahd is 5th edition's version of Advanced Dungeon Dragon's classic Ravenloft adventure from the 1980s, and it's really well done. However, Strahd is a bit weaker than his original appearance. To correct this and make him a foe worthy of his reputation, I would update his Life Force Drain ability to that of AD&D's vampires. This means in addition to his listed necrotic damage and hit point drain, the victim would also lose two character levels from each bite attack made against them, reducing their attack rolls until they receive magical restoration. You may even rule that a victim regains one loss level per long rest until they are back to full health. Also worth mentioning, in 3rd edition, vampires drained 1d4 points of constitution for each successful bite attack, 
So feel free to make Strahd more capable than the watered down version we are given in 5th edition because the 5th edition version never would have lasted as long as he has. I hope this look at vampires has been useful to you and I appreciate your support by liking this video and tell me in the comments your thoughts. I am sure I will make more videos about vampires in the future. There's just so much information to cover and we could focus on specific types and encounter ideas. Has this video been helpful to you? I sure hope so. As always, I'm your host Atten here at We Love TTRPGs and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.